it was really, it was complete sabotaging of my mindset. Like if it was, I know I'm not good enough to win this show, but if I sabotage myself, then it's easier for my mind to handle because I know that. Because I can rationalize. Yeah, because I can happen. rationalize me yeah. not being my best because I stuffed up. Sitting in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm walking down the road. I saw the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> uh, my great friend Josh Lenarowitz is joining us on the Muscle Action Podcast today. And we're going to talk about how Josh became one of the biggest human beings on the planet. And I think that's a really interesting area of discussion because most people assume that it's just about you know eating more and and most people make their their judgments, man. And the thing I love about you, Josh, is you bring something of value to the conversation every time we talk. You always have great insights. You said something to me last week, and I was just like, it was it was probably something you didn't even acknowledge, and it was just so uh, insightful, and I thought everybody needed to hear it, and we'll, I'll, I'll bring it up with you. Um, you know, the idea of a gateway. We talked, we said, you mentioned yeah. that, and I thought that was like, gosh, the fact that you acknowledge that is very brilliant. Uh, but man, thank you for give, taking the time. I know it's uh, right in the middle of prep, but uh, thank you. No, thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me on, and um, thanks for coming to our sort of beautiful city, but it's extremely hot. Ah, oh, dude, I love it though. Yeah. It's, it's hot, but it's dry. You know, spending a lot of my time in Tampa is uh, this hot sometimes. Yeah, it's beautiful. But place. so humid. This yeah. is great. Like okay. you go outside and sweat. Tampa, you go outside, you're like pouring. Yeah. You got to bring a change of shirt and where you're going. It's so you great. like training in the heat though? Do you feel it drops your Here, overload? I love it. Okay. In Tampa, it's like, ugh. like, yeah, it's gross. Yeah. But here it's great because it's almost like the, the sweat evaporates. Like I didn't break a sweat when I'm training here. It's yeah. great. I mean, but I do, but. Man, you have like the best gym I've ever seen. Like it was a playground for me <laughs> oh, thank you, man. in Tampa, like 2017. It's the only yeah. gym I've seen with like proper one kilogram in increments. It's like the perfect progressive overload. Dumb Thanks, rack. Man. Yeah. So well done. Uh, man, I just built it like like you. Like I was, a, I love bodybuilding and I built it because I wanted a playground for me. And it's turned into something that the irony of it is the second you get it, it's time to retire yeah. for me. Um, but uh, dude, that was just, I built it with to my specs, and it seems like everyone else in the world appreciates it. So oh, yeah, thank it's you. amazing. Thanks, man. Dude, I'd love to have you back. And I would love to. Yeah, maybe if Please. you're prepping for the Olympia this year, um, yeah. come down, spend a couple months or a couple weeks, and, and uh, we'll smash each other a little bit. I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to put 30 kilos back on. <laughs> like the comeback. Yeah. Well, dude, I don't have it in me anymore, man. You know, you, you need that fire. And that's one thing I really want to talk to you about is like, because last time we spoke, we had some. Um, maybe deeper conversations about this sport. And I think that would be one of the greatest things that people uh, can get off of you is perspective, you yeah. know, cause like the reason, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I left the sport. I love bodybuilding, man. I'll always love bodybuilding. I'll forever be a bodybuilder. I'll train for the rest of my life. Um, but the reason I left the sport is, you know, the ultimate, you know, there's a lot, I guess, to say, but one of the reasons was I lost my purpose. Like, why am I doing this? Like, I don't need it anymore. And you mentioned that to me last time you're questioning your reason yeah um and now it seems you, you found it and you, you're you're really getting after it and you're really training hard you look bigger than ever and better than ever and sh absolutely shredded sitting in front of me probably in excess of 300 pounds very close yeah yeah close to 300 um and you know arms are an inch bigger and everything looks bigger talk to me about that man, man. talk to me about the the i want to talk to me talk to me about the um the questioning of it for sure because i think it's powerful yeah and then where it's gone man there's many ways i can go with this i mean letting bodybuilding define you and your character is is one thing and that's a dangerous thing because if you don't have that all of a sudden you don't have anything in gone. life so that yep. can't be your whole purpose of life but at the same time if you love it then you're going to get more out of it and it got to the point with me where i was in love with bodybuilding and then all this stuff happened in 2017 with living with Dallas and he passed away and he was a young upcoming bodybuilder and and um, I didn't sort of like the way things were around that whole situation and it, it made me lose my love for bodybuilding the whole foundation of my love for it was rocked and when you don't love something you don't do the extra hours you don't put the extra work yeah, and in. I think even before that a little bit like when we were in uh, Europe Spain? yeah in Barcelona you were kind of like oh man you know and we were both in the same boat yeah, I'm like, Dude, I'm yeah I remember like, you were like exactly like that I'm yeah done, man. and Kuwait we were both like yeah. that 
Yeah, it's kind of for me. That's the end of prep. I'm kind of always a little bit like that. The end of prep. <laughs> yeah, ready to go into yeah, off season. But I'm not normally like that. Like leading up to the Olympia, sure. I should be fired up, and this is you know the best competition in the world. And I just was, and I just couldn't wait for it to be done and over. Yeah. And and I mean, there's <clears throat> you've, you probably would have seen that study where they've got those two mice and they've yoked it one wheel to the next wheel, and one of the mice has the choice to run in the wheel, and the other one is forced to run it. It's locked in that wheel. And they thought exercise is great indefinitely. So the mouse that would run in the wheel would have all the positive endorphins and dopamine and things like that. But the other mouse who was forced to run wouldn't. It was all the stress. It was all the negative effects. So ah, being forced to do I've something. I've never seen that study. Yeah, That's it's brilliant. incredible. It's like being forced to do something is completely negative to what you meant to do. So, And, and that's Dallas what, and I talked about that ironically. Oh, right? wow. is, you know, so when I was competing, like early in my career, I loved bodybuilding is all I want to do. And then when you have to and somebody's paying you and they're telling you what show you got to do, yeah. you're like, oh, well, I don't want to do it anymore. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I remember you coming, it was 2000 and maybe 13 or 14, you were here. And I remember you, as soon as you turned around, you stood on your calves and the whole crowd was just like, whoa. <laughs> and I was sitting there with Liz like grabbing like, whoa. That. <laughs> that was the most freakiest thing I've seen. Yeah, it was, um, and you could tell you loved it then. Yeah. That was when you were, you were in love with I it. Did, yeah. But when you're not in love with it, man, it's like, you just don't want to do it anymore. And that's why I had the whole of the last year off. And I was, um, you know, it was kind of like a post-traumatic stress thing. Um, like for those that don't know what happened with Dallas, he passed away. Basically, I was the one that found him. And just having to deal with that Dude, whole situation. my heart just sank. Like, yeah, I, I, it was. I'm very, um, yeah, I feel like, it, you know. I didn't care for bodybuilding. It was more like, it was just that whole experience and, and then I've kind of heard heard something, you know, which ref refresh. You know, you can look at it as PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder, or you can look at it like a past. What was, how do they project it? It was um, a, part, a PT. What's it called? P PTE past past traumatic experience. So looking at it from a different perspective, and that can get you through things. I think when you're stuck looking at one sort of facet. Anytime you put a label on something and this is what I've had and this is yeah. who I am, that's a big problem, man. And I love that you see that because like, dude, I think you look at it and say, what did I gain from that? You know, like I gained, maybe I should pay attention to stuff. And yeah. not that he didn't, like, exactly. I, I don't know what he was doing, but perspective is so valuable, especially because, you, dude, you know what we do is toe in the line, man. Like, yeah. you're always pushing. Any time you're 300 pounds plus, no matter if you're absolutely shredded or not, strain in your heart, man. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a scan out there you can get. It's called a CT angiogram, an echocardiogram, and it's a test for the occlusions and blockages through your artery walls. And that's the, the most accurate test you can have. If any, anyone out there who's, you know, pushing the limits with size, whether it be a strength sport or anything, you know, go and get that test. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so valuable. No matter, like, we're very fortunate in Australia. We don't have to pay for many tests. But, I mean, internationally, you know, you, you can't put a price on, on your life. So... Um, I just think that's an invaluable test to have. But just getting just tested get regularly, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I had, I my my dad regularly. had a heart attack in 2015. Oh, so the second that happened, I literally went straight to the doctor. Yeah. And I was like, I need that. Yeah, well, like, people do the stress test where they run, but that's not accurate. Like, it's I think it was one of the presidents. I can't remember which one had it, and then two weeks later, he had a heart attack. Oh well. So and that showed that he was fine. So the CT angiogram is the only one that can really test it. Um, but going back, it was that. It was falling out of love with it. And then I was just, you know, me and my wife were just talking and she's always so supportive. And, and it was just that. It was like, well, don't do it if you don't love it. Yeah. Had a bit of a rest right. and just found the love for it and just trained and had a good rest. And I, I feel it, great. I think it's in who you are, man. And it's in who I am. And like I, I talk about this when I first retired, I was like, man, I want to lose all this weight and I want to uh, do all this, this other stuff. And I still do. I still love training, man. I still love the daily challenge, the yeah. daily discipline. Like I feel lost without, um, you know, the daily regiment with the nutrition. Structure. And I love that shit. I'm so much more productive. It's part of who I am. And I, I'm still going to lose muscle. I'm still going to lose weight, but it's going to be still an attempt to train really hard, maintain maximum strength and, uh, you know, kind of get to whatever size my body wants to be at while being healthy. You know, if I can't run, if I can't, if I can't walk, that's a huge problem. Yeah. But I'm looking at all these kind of objective me measures. Like, are you sleeping well? Are you able to walk? Are you able to whatever, enjoy life? Like if you can, then you're doing great. Right. At the end yeah. of the day. And, um, so not being attached to the scale uh, since I've left, but so getting back to your kind of cognitive state, man, um, what do you think it was prior to Dallas that, um, 
maybe even rewinding further than that, starting with like where your passion started for bodybuilding. Cause I think it's important to know kind of the root yeah. of why you think bodybuilding drew you, like drew you toward it. Yeah. My, my start of it, I started training when I was 14 and it was a, a privilege to me to train because I was 12 and I wanted to train and my parents didn't want me to. There was that whole concept of stunning your growth. And it was my older brother who was a huge influence. He was training and he had all the posters on the wall and, I just really wanted to get closer to my brother. It was more about connection for me than the body. And, um, and that's what really drew me to the sport. Um, so when I was old enough to work, it was at 14 in Australia, so I was old enough to train. So I started working, I started training in the gym. Um, nothing about nutrition or anything like that. It was just get up at 6 a.m., ride my bike to the gym and train. And um, there was like farm animals coming through the gym. Like it was like I come from a, a small country town of 15,000 people. So Where's that was, relative to my It's in sale. It's like the bottom of Australia. As far as you can go, it's like 30 minutes from the coast. Um, so where you are in Melbourne now, it's like three hours down south. Um, and then the furthest point is Tassie, but that's got to go across the ocean right. at that, that point. But um, yeah, so that was really what got me into it was my brother. And then bodybuilding was that. It was, I was working so hard and I'm like, well, where's the result? You know, I work, I'm working and the money is the result. And of course the body is the result. But I'm like, there's got to be more than that. If I'm, is there a sport? What's the sport? Like the bodybuilding's a sport, let me do that. Um, and I started prepping and my dad was diagnosed with cancer at the time and I was going to pull out of the show and he said keep going because it's going to keep him focused and literally the day that he had his kidney removed I had my first bodybuilding comp and I was a junior and I won the junior in the open uh, the overall so I got two trophies so it was like one for me and one for him and it was kind of like a real symbolic moment for me How old were you? 20 yeah so it was I competed for the first couple of years. It's called the International Natural Bodybuilding Association. So I was like, got to like second in the world at that when I was like 23. And um, that year, actually, my dad had passed. And that comes back to probably what I went through in 2017. It was like giving so much to something and then seeing someone so close pass. And then that whole disconnect of like, man, is this really what I want to be doing with my life? I'm putting all this time and energy and I'm missing out on social occasions birthdays or, or not even if you're there for the birthday you know how it is you're really not there because right. you can't sink into a deep conversation you're so into you're your just, own world yeah you just yeah. focus on the next meal the next cardio session the next ca training session how much sleep am i going to get tonight if i get to sleep at this time i'll get this much sleep and you can't really have a pure conversation with substance mm -hmm. and that's what i hate about it that's what i hate about bodybuilding and that's why i kind of have this um belief with bodybuilding is when you're doing a prep you put everything into it, and then when you're not prepping in your off season, that's when you invest in relationships. And it's like that bank account analogy. Mm -hmm. If you're constantly withdrawing from the bank account, you're going to be bankrupt. And so yeah. relationships just like that, friendships are just like that. So when I'm not competing, I'm trying to invest into all the bank accounts around me, basically. Yeah, I believe that when I was competing too, man. And since removing myself, like I always question my my beliefs. You know, I'm like, why why do I have to be that way? And I wonder if I could go back. And people ask me all the time, like, could you go back and be a different person? And the reality was no, because I, that's all I knew at the time. Now looking back at it, I, I wonder, like, could you actually have a social life? Could you? I, I don't know the answer. Like, I, I think, you know, could you go back and, and be the best in the world at anything and be half in? Like, I just don't think so. Yeah, man. Like, I talked to Dorian yeah. about that. I think it's like the only way to do it is to be ruthless, man. And if mm -hmm. you want to be, if you want to be a, a billionaire, like, you have to be ruthless. Yeah, mm -hmm. and not necessarily a bad way, but like just ruthless with your time, ruthless with your focus. Like, there's no way I could have been more giving with my time and, and still been the person I was. There's no way. Like, you know, it's because especially when you're, you're tired, you're calorie depleted, you're training hard, your focus is so fragile. Like when I go to the gym, man, if someone talks to me, I could throw off the whole workout. Yeah. <laughs> so I put my headphones on, I put my hat on, I'd be getting, like, I need to stay in my zone because I didn't have the, the mental fortitude or the mental ability to, to go out of the zone and come back in. Now I do, but I'm also not pulling to the, pushing the same limit. Like now I can have a conversation with you and be a ruthless beast in 15 seconds from now uh, just because I have that. I've been training my mind to do that. Yeah. But during my career, there's no way. And I, I, again, I don't know, you know, but um, so. See, I can do that. I can, I'm fortunate enough to do that. I can switch on and off in between sets, great. which is great. But then I find that everything around that during prep, like going out, like oh, I think yeah. we've been invited out for steaks tonight. I was invited with you guys. Yeah. And Came I was on. like, yes. And yeah. then it, yeah, like I said in Perth, gateway. it was like a gateway. Was, yeah. the, the thing with the gateway, me, I'm so bad with the diet, as in like <laughs> I have to, and I'm honest, like I hate the diet. People are like, you got to be strict and you got to love it. I'm like, I just don't. Right. I'm someone who just, if I get a taste of it, it'll be like, 
I think that's, it'll be that's a the huge reason, outlet for me. That's the reason you're 300 pounds. And that's the reason I was 300 pounds. It's like we probably have the gene, and I know I have the gene for obesity, like which is all that is, is, is you don't get the cue to stop eating. Yeah. Right? That's really oh, what yeah. it is. So, yeah. my, I mean, dude, my daughter's got this. Like, my daughter's five years old. She's very lean, stupidly active, but like, she eats as much as me. Yeah. Like, yeah. she's a beast. Wow. Um, so she'll sit down and eat a 12 ounce steak, you know, 300 gram steak, no questions, <laughs> yeah. five. I was like, oh my goodness, like you got to keep active and you gotta, you're got to you going to be muscular. <laughs> she did 28 pull-ups the other day. I was like, not in a row, but like 28 in about 10 minutes. I was like, God. That's awesome. What a beast. But yeah, that, that's a gene, right? That's a real yeah. thing. And I think wow. that was, that's part of what makes us who we are. Like yeah. that's part of what made us so successful. Like what's the biggest bottleneck in eating or, or sorry, in bodybuilding? Sometimes people's ability to eat and build because yep. you're not recovering enough. You're not training it hard enough, you know? So I think that's makes you who you are so the fact yeah. that you acknowledge that and go i know that this is going to happen therefore i will not go out and eat steak yeah like my my gateway was always sushi it was like you need sushi after you train i'm like no i can't why not because it, the second i eat it i, I want everything yeah it leads to, exactly it's that's what i'm meaning by gateway it leads to everything and anything and you rationalize yeah, exactly mind. i'm like i'm already breaking <laughs> the diet now and then yeah. it's cookies, and then it's like fried chicken, and then it's everything, and then yeah. and then I <laughs> and then I don't want to go to sleep because I want to force more food in. Yeah, because like, I, the next day it all you, starts again, and that's the suffering. And then you can't sleep because you're choking on yeah, it. It's like yeah. oh, as a reflex. Sleep and you got gas <laughs> because you're so clean with all your eating. Yeah, it's horrible. But my my thoughts were always that it's um, like an addiction kind of thing as well, like a dopamine. Sure, sure it is. so much There's dopamine from levels. food. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there was like a study that I, I, I read. It was like how many points of dopamine are secreted and released from food, how much is from like alcohol, cocaine, things like that. And then the more that someone's attached to it, the higher the dopamine release. And I think when you're neglecting it and restricting it so long, like that's why food tastes so damn good when you sure. diet. And when you build it up in your mind, like that's why I'm not an advocate of like cheat days, right? Is because you're building this thing up in your mind to be so amazing. It's just a fucking cookie or something. Yeah. <laughs> like it's not that big of a deal. It's yeah. never as good as you build it up to be in your mind, right? Like you build, oh, it's cheesecake. Who fucking cares? Like, yeah. you know, you, you just, because you're not having it, you, it's like, the, you know, that thing you can't have. It's like, oh my gosh, now I need it. No, you don't. Like, yeah, it's exactly. not going to be that good. Relax. Yeah, and I think getting through it, it has to be a non negotiable behavior because if there's any negotiation you, you're going to always go for the easy option and i think there's there's that thing about denying it battle as soon as you allow that battle to come into your mind you can have confirmation bias with anything you know oh maybe i do need a cheat meal to, to refeed i've got a big day of training tomorrow so of course you're going to mentally confirm it in your mind to go and do that and how often do you do that because you're doing your own prep yeah yeah so um, do you plan everything or do you uh, actually just rationalize things sometimes um no i'm really quite i know now not to rationalize because that's when I go off and that's where the gateway comes mm -hmm. in and I'm lucky this time with prep I started like 20 weeks and I mean there was there was preps I had where I'm, I'm very like internally motivated motivated more than in extrinsically so if I see a photo like if I do a guest pose like one time I did a guest pose two weeks before my Arnold debut and it was like wow I'm happy with that and the next thing I know, I was going through McDonald's, getting like chocolate sundaes. And it was like the biggest joke. Like I've told this story before. I was like, went through, got two. And I was so embarrassed about it. I'm like, finished them as soon as I'm out of the drive through And I'm going back around again. And I'm like, oh, two more. And the lady was just like making conversations. Oh, two more. I'm like, oh, yeah, the, my, my wife wants some. And then like, <laughs> she did. And then I'm drive eating. And then I'm like. I need some more. Yeah. I'm like literally down the road, finished them, turned around, got two more, like six Sundays. And she's like, another two. I'm like, oh, the kids. I don't have kids. I was just like, you know when you're dieting, <laughs> die brain, you're like, you feel like accused. So I'm like, I knew there was a mental issue there when I was going like trying to justify that crap. But that's what I meant. I was like mentally, um, I was satisfied from the photos. When I know that my standard now has to be higher than that for myself. So now going into this next contest, I've got, and like anything, you kind of learn as you go and you get better at it and, and you learn more tools with other nutrition or mental mindset stuff or so I think now coming into this prep, I've been in the best position starting at 20 weeks out and having a few hiccups along the way and getting rid of them before like now when it's six weeks out, just under six weeks out. So now there's no more F-ups. So I'll tell you, man, if I have one regret from bodybuilding and I don't have many, it's that I didn't go more extreme. Like that's the only regret you'll ever have is like I want to go way more extreme because looking back on it, you want to have that one day of, of like the peak of the mountain where you're just like absolutely inside out, absolutely yeah. huge. And, and like that's where you should be focusing on because yeah. that's the only regret you're ever going to have that you just didn't push quite hard enough. Never going to regret like, uh, I don't know, like the cheat meal you didn't have. You know, yeah. you're going to be like, God, I wish I was just that 
inside out shredder that just a little bit bigger like i wish i you know just push totally a little bit agree. harder yeah we both have that same extreme mentality yeah. we're like i want to go a little bit faster a little bit harder and a little bit heavier you know yeah you that's always a, regret that the thing you didn't do i totally agree and like it kind of goes back to what we said about confirmation bias before um and having like if you get in that kind of condition and you feel like you're almost there and all of a sudden it's, all it takes is a, a simple thing yeah. like going out and eating a steak and then all of a sudden so you... So is he accountable? Like she keep you accountable? No, she kind of just lets me do what I want and that's kind of what I like about her too yeah. because I'm like, she's not my coach, she's my wife. Right. So she'll just let me let me be because it's all on my shoulders right. just to stuff it up. Or, At the same time, man, I think it's important to have someone who's completely honest with you. Like, yeah. hey man, you're in really good shape or hey man, like he... We got a few more weeks to go. Like that's what people lack, I think. Is yeah. and you know I listened to a lot of Jordan Peterson. Do you know if he is? Yeah, it was awesome. Um, Sam Harris. Like he says, the only way to to truly live your greatest life is if you have a foundation of honesty, both with yourself and with your spouse and with the people around you. Like if you have people around you, you're always telling you what you want to hear. You can't be your best person. And I think that's the most powerful thing in the world. And most coaches aren't going to be honest with you, man. Like yeah. maybe, but. It's hard to be honest with someone, especially in our sport, because most guys' egos are so big. If I say to you, Josh, you're not ready, man. Yeah. Like I'm worried you're gonna fire me. I'm worried, you know what I mean? Like yeah, I'm, totally I'm like, that. oh, like, and, and so that that's what you need. All that's what we all need. And I yeah. didn't even have that during my career. Like the only guy that ever did it for me was our friend Chad. Yeah. Like complete yeah, he's brutal, honesty. Man. Yeah, he's no like, matter how good how good you think you look, he's like, yep, just keep pushing the condition. That's all we yeah. get back from him. Yeah, more cardio. Like, yeah, more cardio. Right. Hard, I'm dying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Damn, I'm like, like dying. Fuck. Here. <laughs> yeah. he, he does push it artist. You, you know the way I look at it though, as well with it being extreme, like because everyone's got that, and this is comes back to kind of my methods of dieting is people have, I believe, this notion that you can push yourself too hard, you can limit too many calories, and I think to in a, to a point that's. I don't, I don't believe it's true. Like I believe that, one, for example, I saw this this thing on the news one time and these people were stranded at sea and the only way they could survive was eating raw fish. And the people that didn't eat it died and the people that did survived and they come back and they were just like shredded lean and tan because they were in the sun all the time. So it's obviously unhealthy, but they were just like, they survived and they were completely peeled. And I'm like, well, they survived with such little calories. And I mean, of course, we're doing cardio and training sure. and trying to well, maximize that. I've done three days of fasting. Yeah. I didn't lose an ounce of muscle. Wow. Okay. Right. Because uh, the first 24 hours, you're hungry. Yeah. After that, your body starts burning fat. And, you know, like, so you're like, okay, this is interesting. You just keep getting leaner and leaner and leaner. And I'm, I'm going to push to do a five day fast. But, like, yeah, wow. Yeah. I mean, you think, like, oh, you lose a bunch of muscle. I didn't lose an ounce. I was able. So here's a funny story. The first time I met Dom D'Agostino, if you know who he is, but he's like the ketogenic godfather. Um, I met him in the gym and he, he, he was on his the sixth day of a seventh day, a seven day fast. And he was doing uh, four fifty five bent rows and six plate deadlifts. Wow. He's 190 pounds, maybe, maybe 195 and fifth day or sixth day of a seven no day food. fast, zero food. That and I was like, insane. dude, what is going on? He goes, Oh, you know, I'm fasting. I'm like, he's like, yeah, normally I'm a little bit stronger. I was like, what? Like you serious? He's like, yeah, man. Like, so after two, two days, he's like, dude, there's no more hunger. Your body's running on ketones. Your body's, body's just exclusively burning fat. And that for me, that was like 2011, maybe 2012. That was a paradigm shift for me. I didn't understand. And that was like sending me down this idea of exploring this stuff. Like what happens when you fast? Well, you're, eventually your body doesn't have any more glycogen to burn. It starts because it wants to maintain some glycogen. It always mm. will. So your body starts burning fat. Like, so we have this paradigm of, I don't eat for six hours and lose muscle. No, you're not. Like, yeah, yeah. you're not. You're going to deplete glycogen. And then after 24 hours, you start burning fat and you're like, Oh, and it's, it's just an interesting paradigm shift for bodybuilders, right? Because we're always like, if we're hungry, we assume that we're losing muscle, which if you're always dependent on carbohydrate is probably true. So, you know, you have your two energy systems and you want your body to burn fat at rest, not carbs at rest. And that's mm. kind of contingent on what you eat going in. Or if you're fast for, fasting for longer than 24, 36 hours, it's just like exclusively ketones and fat burning. It's super interesting physiology, man. That it is. is a paradigm shift for bodybuilders. Yeah, you know what I had? I did a 24-hour fast at like eight weeks out. Mm -hmm. And I just thought I just want to try and speed it up a little bit and get ahead. And it could have been just my whole mind playing a game with me because the next day I trained and it was it was down lower. But it would, like I'm saying, it, if, I'm, if I had kind of that, if I'd seen that in person and the guy lifting that much weight after five days, I probably would have been more mentally So 24 hours would be myself. that time where you would still feel a little bit sluggish. Okay. But the, the way to, to kind of mitigate it is water and sodium. So most people, the, the problem you uh, lack. So with glycogen, which your body's burning through glycogen, with glycogen comes water. Yeah. So uh, glycogen comes out, so does the water. So does the sodium. Electrolytes are all coming out. 
So if you replace water and sodium, you're fine. And that's wow. what that's what most people feel kind of crappy on a ketogenic diet because the glycogen is coming out, they feel lethargic, but it's just because they're lacking sodium. Yeah. So if you put that back in, like it's a tremendous difference, man. Um, so, I mean, not that you're going to do that, get ready for the Arnold, but uh, at some point, like the idea of, of an extended fast is mentally, you never felt better. It's yeah. like, it's crazy how, how great your brain can feel with zero food. Um, but yeah, you know, your performance volume, well, you'd have to decrease. Uh, like you wouldn't be doing 20 sets for biceps and triceps because yeah. you, you will start breaking down muscle. Once the glycogen is depleted, your body's going to start breaking down muscle. So you'd have to do minimum volume, higher loads, and uh, you know, just keeping the volume down so you're not burnt. But it's such a fascinating thing that people, you know, as a bodybuilder, is completely paradigm shifting. Yeah, well, that's I'm looking forward to that when I, I do stop bodybuilding, like trying, trying out vegan for a while, trying fasting for a while. Like those are all the things that it's kind of again, almost against what my mindset is sure. with building muscle. So. Yeah, I definitely want to try that stuff for sure. Yeah. Dig into your mindset now, man. Like how you get the most out of your sessions. So, you know, I, you're a strong dude, man. And I know you know you're strong and I know you push hard. You lift very, very heavy. Um, how do you get yourself motivated to do that every day? And you said you're internally motivated. I'd love for you to talk about that because most people in current society are externally motivated, right? Mm -hmm. They're motivated by posting on Instagram, PBs and uh, whatever. Tell me about your internal motivation and why you get inspired to, to be so great. Um, I don't know where, I can't really pinpoint where it, it came from. I mean, early back in the day, it was connecting to my brother, mm -hmm. as I was saying earlier. And and that was kind of like the biggest competition for me. If I can beat my brother in the gym, I can beat anyone. He's two years older than you? Yeah, he's five, actually. Five. Um, yeah, so I thought I could, if I could beat him, I could beat anyone kind of mindset. And I noticed that I was quite strong at a young age. And then living in the country that was... Like I was saying, only fifteen thousand people there. So there was, and that was really before like the internet and books and stuff. So I was kind of having to learn a lot of things by myself. Um, and then coming to Melbourne, driving to Melbourne and competing against other people here, I was, I definitely had an improvement on those other people. And we had the same, as I was saying, it was like a natural federation. So it was like the same level playing field. But I was, I mean, genetics are always coming into it. But sure. I was still far more advanced with muscularity. What did you weigh when you competed naturally? Like, 93 okay. kilograms. And, oh, wow, that's yeah, so, so I was, Yeah, I was and, the biggest. And until what age were you competing in naturally? That was, so I was from 20, 20, 21, 22, 23. And then that was the year my dad passed away. And I did that last show. And, and that's when I, I got second at the World Championships. And I was like, this is horrible. Like, I don't want to, what am I doing with my life? And that, that was, was also natural yeah, progression. Yeah, that was like, that was that. It was like, um, what am I investing all this time in here for? And... And they're like, well, you do it because you love it. And I'm like, yeah, well, if I love it, I don't need to do it on stage. I just need to train and train for myself. Um, and that's when I just went and just trained consistently for myself. Um, but as far as the lifting and the progressive over, that's what's always challenged me in the gym. That's what always kept me motivated. I mean, I was saying earlier about building up my arm density, progressive overload's been always what I've believed in. It was just small incrementing sets to one hard, heavy overload set. Um, and the longer the rest break towards the end to make sure there's full recovery and that's what I believe a huge restriction is your respiratory rate and that's what I base my recovery on I mean when and when I coach people they say how long is my rest break in between sets and my advice is it's completely individual to the person if you're someone who's like a fitness chick competitor you're going to be able to bounce back because your recovery is so quick whereas a guy who's 300 pounds they take so much longer to get their heart rate back down and that's a huge limiting factor because your body physiologically is going to focus on that as a priority than muscle connection and muscle connections the main component if you don't connect with it then everything else is going to fail um so of course progressive overload but then with the connection in mind if you you can't just lift heavy and have no connection and because the body's a master compensator it will just get the weight up whichever way it can but with bodybuilding you need to be particular with your execution and recruitment pattern so you're actually able to overload the muscle in the right way and that for me has always been the best um, motivator because it's just been comparing my weights against myself previously and sort of how far can I push myself and how far um, can I maximize my genetic potential that's been the biggest motivator for me. Talk to me about how you feel that natural competitions has impacted your long-term progression so like training natural man like I have so much respect for guys who compete long-term natural because there's no cutting corners, man. For there's, sure. there's no like, hey, man, I'm going to take some clean and I'm going to get shredded or I'm going to take some T3 or something like, no, no, no. Like you're doing cardio, you're watching your diet. And uh, talk to me about how you think that competition, if, if at all, has impacted your long term, the person you've become. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It has. It's um, going back to competing. I just I wanted to stay that way all my life. That was my lifelong dream to stay that way. And 
but I actually always wanted to do the Olympia, so it was kind of like a double-edged sword. Um, but I got real. I would I'd work so, such long hours. Like I was after competing, I was going through a quest, like trying to find my purpose in either religion or business, or I mean, most people have been on this quest. <laughs> And you realise that it's not any of those things. It's, yeah. it's a whole bunch of things and it's people and it's love and all that stuff and, you know, kumbaya and hands together kind of <laughs> shit. Yeah, but it's like sure. you, you find out it's all these things that create you the person. Um, but it was – I got really sick because I was working super long hours. What I was like, I was doing PT and I had a, a hormone replacement clinic. So I was doing like both. Um, uh, so it was like big long hours. Um, and I could see the benefit with, with the HRT stuff, but I got really sick. Um, I had post-traumatic fatigue syndrome, so it was like chronic fatigue, but you're always getting sick and doctors are always prescribing antibiotics and then your internal flora goes away and it's kind of like a quick fix when you see the doctors and take antibiotics and you'll be right. Um, and then I got really bad food poisoning and it was like, it just threw me. I got like this rash on my head, part of my tricep wasted away. Um, I got like this digest all these digestive issues and I went on this quest through the medicine like going through a, a neurologist to a gastroenterologist to an endocrinologist and just trying to find out who could make me better because I was always constantly sick then. How um, old were you then? I was 20, 28, 20, between, it was like 26 and a half and 28. How much did you weigh? Um, at that point I was, before I got sick I was 114 and then I went down. I was, I was puffy though, I wasn't like shredded, right. 114. And then I'd go down to like 105, so I was like fluctuating around there. Um, and then I actually had it prescribed, that was the first time for me it was something that was going to make me better physically, but I didn't want to do because I was a diehard natty and um, not knowing the benefits of it and having you know everything around surrounding it being such negative stigma. Um, so as soon as that did happen, I mean with all the natural dieting training methods I'd learned along the way, it was just an easy pickup for me because I wasn't relying on that. It was the diet yeah. and the training that do everything and then that's just something extra. Dude, I train so many natural athletes and I'm like, I strongly encourage everyone who wants to compete, like yeah. you do it natural for five years first because yeah. you just develop such good habits, man. Like, the, like I said, there's no cutting corners. You yeah. diet, you cardio, you pose, you have to, otherwise you're screwed. For and, sure. And bodybuilders, you start in, you know, cutting corners early, they just develop bad habits. Oh, it, like everything works when that is in play. Like you can't learn your body when that's a component, you need to learn your body the natural way. Right. And that's how you know what exercises work best for your physique. And yeah, training especially, yeah. right? Like you, you can get away with some stuff training when you're enhanced. Like you just throw some weight around, you're going to grow. But if you actually want to learn how to build muscle, man, that's that's probably why you're so balanced. And like you seem healthy now, right? And that's such a cool thing is um, so many bodybuilders get to your size and they look like shit and they look like they're going to die and their blood pressure is high and they can't walk upstairs and they don't look healthy. Like you always look healthy. Yeah, and that's tremendous respect, man. Like, Appreciate that's it. the way I tried to live my life. It's like, everyone always said, man, you look so healthy. Like, I'm like, well, fuck, I hope so. Like, why, yeah. why wouldn't I be healthy, right? <laughs> Just because I build muscle doesn't mean I have to be unhealthy. And that's an important lesson for people to learn from you is it doesn't have to be synonymous with being uh, unhealthy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. When I really try to get as big as possible in my off season, this time around, I got to like 320, 325. Um, and I'm like, how do these strong men get so damn, how are they still healthy and functional and lifting all this weight. And I'm like, well, sleep's a huge factor. Sleep apnea, they're all on sleep machines. So I got a sleep machine and I tried that out and I was like, this is like horrible lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> having it's like a, a prisoner. Sleep. Yeah, and it's bad yeah. for your, your partner as well. You got this like sleep yeah, exactly. machine. It's good and for your sex life. Yeah, exactly. You got this mask on like Darth Vader. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, but it was Who like- wants to sleep with Bane tonight? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's like, um, it, does, it, it is an extra component on getting performance out. I noticed the first time I wore it, the strength was up dramatically the next day. Huh. But it was like, it's a limiting factor too. It's like, it's it, your quality of sleep, it's hard to adjust to it. And halfway through sleep, the mask comes off and like, it's a full proper mask. But yeah, I'm like, I was trying to look at all the ways to increase performance. And and that's kind of been me with without a coach. I try to learn every kind of way, every advantage getting advice from people and like anything, you go on your own journey and you take on board what you believe works or you apply what you believe works and if it doesn't work for you, you discard it. And it's not to knock anyone's methods or training or anything because there's yeah. so many beliefs out there. It's just a way of you figuring out what's going to work best for you and 
I'll, you... I'll tell you, all of my learning, you know, began when I left bodybuilding. I, I wouldn't say all of it, but a lot of it, because when you're attached to how you look today, or when you're attached to like, hey, I have the Olympia in 16 weeks, you have the sense of urgency, which makes you kind of stay within the walls of what you know that has got you there in the past. And when you're removed from the, the necessity of looking a certain way or having a certain end goal or a timeline, it just allows you to kind of open up your paradigm to like what else is out there and what else is possible. And like, I can try, I don't have to train like any particular way anymore. I can go and play, I can go and mess around. I can go and experiment with like this type of thing that's going to influence my sleep or this type of nutrition. Like I can do fasting, I can do vegan, I can do all these yeah. things. So you actually start to get a little more of a broad uh, view of how, what, how everything impacts you, you know? And the one thing that I think has been my biggest um, eye opener as far as it, why did anybody teach me this earlier is the autonomic nervous system, right? Looking at the sympathetic parasympathetic dynamic and understanding uh, how ultimately that's stress, which is like your uh, hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal axis, uh, and then how that influences our entire state. So recovery, sleep, digestion, yeah. focus, um, all those things are directly being impacted by the HPA and, and um, the autonomic nervous system. And it, like, gosh, like someone needs to teach this stuff, right? So as you see that huge influence on sleep, when you have that sleep, you be stronger the next day. My brain goes to, okay, well, that's just a greater parasympathetic input, giving you the greater ability to push your autonomic nervous system further, your central nervous system further. So, I mean, so many things that, um, you know, we're attached to these mechanisms when we're competing and then we no longer have it. It's such a beautiful opportunity to like, now you can see the whole forest rather than just that one tree, yeah. you know? Yeah, and, I've, I've definitely thought about that concept too. And that's influenced my, I guess, my nutrition timing, having... Because it was so inbuilt in us, and I definitely supplements have their place. You know, every time people would have a post workout shake, and my whole method is, well, you know, when you sit down and you're eating a meal and chewing with your jaw, you know, that sympathetic nervous system should be switched off. We hope. Yeah, we hope. So if you're not on your phone and, and yeah, like stressing yeah, out, yeah, if you're not and, stressed, because I mean, after yeah. having like a huge intense workout, your adrenaline's pumping and your digestion shut off, and then all yeah. of a sudden, and that's what I, I started getting intolerances to weigh because I was always having doing a huge squat deadlift session, basically huge lift. And then I'd smash protein powder mm -hmm. with glucose powder and your digestion is not on. Yeah, it's not on. Yeah. It's just like sitting in your, in your stomach. Yeah. So, you know, sitting there chewing your food and I'm a very slow eater, um, chewing my food. I feel like that's then been able to get me to absorb the food. And then I'll have my shake after that. Interesting. So instead I, I, of having said, it before. I said everybody, like everyone in my, in my programs and anyone who's in my world, I'm like, when you're done, you know, take five minutes, turn your phone off, go sit in the corner, sit in a chair, sit on the floor and breathe yeah like be by yourself be quiet breathe stretch like there's a reason why you know prayer or meditation or whatever you want to call it, it's all the same thing is has been introduced before meals and before sleep right it's like yeah, there's a reason awesome. for that like this yeah, is thousands of years it, yeah. of evolution that people have found this out like if you're eating something you shouldn't be doing you know everything in the world before you eat like sit down and pray for five minutes or, or meditate or whatever yeah, you want to call it right kind of yeah, mindfulness. And then now, okay, now my body's actually prepared to take this. Because, you know, the better you get it or the more consistent you get it, the less time you need, right? Yeah. So at first, some people may need 10 minutes of calm time before their body can actually digest, before they don't get bloating and indigestion. Uh, but if you get good at it, it's like two to three minutes or less. So like, just like breathe, close your eyes, relax, turn off the thoughts. Now your body's prepared. That's to excellent. I've never actually thought of that, doing that before. Dude, it's just great. Sit down, man. And yeah. like, stretch, breathe. Because if you can like my, I use this in the morning, it's like, stretching for me is a very mindful thing because it's actually consciously asking your muscles to relax so like sit into any any posture you want and saying okay now i want this to relax and a feeling it lengthen and like going to the next one feeling it lengthen because to, to lengthen it has to be has to relax mm. if you're tense nothing's relaxed right it's just a, i mean it could be stretching it could be breathing whatever it is and then also bang now we're digesting and now I, I i feel like i'm digesting food faster i can actually eat more or at least i feel like i'm digesting better there's never any bloating and like it's a huge problem that i had during my career is because like, you get it trying to consume as many calories as we do mm. Um, it's the idea of, you know, your body, your stomach is always full. You're always digesting and you're putting food on top of food on top of food because you're always stressed. We're always running around like chicken with their head cut off. Yeah. We're always training multiple times a day. Like how is your body supposed to absorb these calories? It's still the impossibility. Yeah. I'm going to try that stretch before and pray a little yeah. bit before I do my next Just meal. Just chilling out, right? Yeah, like, I really like that. Yeah. What, you finishing your career, what do you feel like now that you've learned if there's like a supplement you could have been taking then is there anything that you I, would have? Man, I don't think or it's a, a particular food. Well, so there, there's a few now? things actually. Like if if I'm being honest, there's like five things that I recommend to everybody, and they're not even things I necessarily did during my career. But 
the one that stands out that would be beneficial to a bodybuilder is collagen protein. So, uh, oh, yeah. Well, and there's a reason, right? So, again, I won't get into the mechanisms and stuff, but I listened to this guy, Chris Masterjohn, who I haven't had on the podcast yet, but I will, a brilliant nutritionist talking about the necessity of bringing glycine, the amino acid glycine, into your nutrition plan. So if someone who eats a massive amount of animal protein, which we do, the amino acid glycine becomes substantially depleted. And when your body doesn't have it from your diet, it pulls it from your soft tissue. So it pulls it from joints and, and collagen um, and, you know, your fascias and stuff like this. Mm. So... Uh, that's why oftentimes joints become achy, become tight, become stiff because you're lacking glycine. So if you're not taking collagen and glycine, you're someone who consumes a massive amount of animal protein, he suggests a one to three ratio. So if I'm taking collagen, I would take, like say, let's say I'm taking um, 250 grams of protein. Uh, I would take in at least 50 to 60 grams of collagen yeah, wow. and cool. making sure I'm having, um, you know, about that one to three ratio of collagen to animal protein. Yeah. So uh, just to supply the glycine that your body needs to actually, you know, keep it there because otherwise it's going to leach it from those soft tissues. Yeah. And that would be a big thing because I know a lot of bodybuilders suffer with, like, I don't know if you get that yet, but toward the end of my career, I was starting to get to that point where I was like, just achy, man. Like, you know, you feel like you're tight. You feel like, even though the training was great, like, you know, I didn't hurt, but it was just like, just like overall, like tightness and as soon as i started adding collagen man gone literally yeah. like within weeks gone days even gone yeah i was like oh wow that's huge and the magnesium if you're not taking at least two grams of magnesium a day take that yep. you know fish oils is great very important um and that's really it methylated b vitamins if you're not taking okay. methylated b vitamins yeah um and for pregnancy as well um it's massive so uh, I stu I'm studying the science of epigenetics. Oh, yeah. So you know what it is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the expression yeah. of genes are these marks that get put on the genes. And it seems like the greatest way to impact it is fish oils and, and these methylation pathways. So uh, supporting methylation when you are pregnant, pre-pregnancy, or anyone who's doing any amount of training, um, like high amounts of training, you're getting methylation marks in your DNA. So it's a really interesting thought, man. Like, you know, I did this in class this morning. Uh, we take, I say to everybody, take a deep breath and you take a deep breath. You go, okay, your body right now has changed the way it's going to transcribe DNA. So in every minute when we're synthesizing protein, your body's transcribing your DNA and it's interpreting the surroundings around you and, and changing the transcription of DNA based on your surroundings to make you more appropriately prepared for your surroundings. So by training every day, you train, you change your genetic expression by breathing the environment every day, where you are in the world changes your expression, the amount of light, the amount of sleep, all these things are changing the way your body synthesizes DNA or, or transcribes DNA. Um, so, you know, adding in things like um, fish oils and, and methylators, can make it more uh, appropriate or maybe uh, just less negatively impacted by the environment. There's mm. methylation marks on your DNA, which so is interesting. Oh, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. It's a very new science, like in the last couple of years. Yeah. But uh, I've got like courses on top of courses now that I'm looking at, look into, like I want to learn about this stuff. But the reality is like not that many people know about it. There's a, I mean, a small group of people in the US, small group of people in the UK, who, I mean, probably tons of people throughout Europe that know, I don't know about, but... Uh, very interesting stuff, man. If you look at like when, so let's say you went into a um, a burning house right now, all that smoke is a signal to your body, and it says, okay, when I'm transcribing this DNA, let, we're going to turn on some genes, turn off some genes to accommodate for this toxin, right? So maybe it increases your your detox pathways. Maybe you don't have the ability to turn on detox pathways, so that's limited. Like so many things that are interested that are interesting about uh, epigenetics. But for anyone pregnant or pre-pregnancy, uh, methylated B vitamins, fish oil. There's a bunch of other things that like uh, methylated folate yeah. that you definitely want to make sure you're getting. And and for you know for dads as well, pre-pregnancy like sperm can be impacted as well. Yeah, wow. Well. Uh, so that's just passing stuff, on to the next generation, your next generation. Yeah, that's yeah. the, the cross-generational uh, genetic inheritance stuff, right? Yeah. So apparently it's three or four generations back. So like what your parents were doing, what their parents were doing is impacting you with these genetic marks. Fascinating stuff. Incredible, right? yeah. Yeah. So uh, talking about your training now, man, like you're uh, you're progressing faster than probably, pretty much anyone in the sport. And, you know, I find that bodybuilders usually hit their kind of limit, and I don't believe there's a limit, but I think there's a limit to what they can do based on the skill set they have. Um, you know, so a bodybuilder will continue to develop the strengths and not develop their weaknesses because, you know, you continue to do what you do um, rather than looking for new ways to, you know, be open-minded and train uh, in better and more intelligently. Yep. You're getting better everywhere. Talk to me about that. Yeah, well, I think as well, you've 
people that get a result from a form of training or, or a bunch of exercises, they also become emotionally connected to that. Yeah. And that's so, hard to, dis- yeah, so yeah. hard to disengage because then you always come back to that thinking that it's going to yield the same result. And then, of course, bodybuilding is making your weak points symmetrical with your strong points. And if you just keep hammering at those same emotional connected exercises, you become more unsymmetrical and unproportioned. Mm-hmm. So um, I think having that, like having a really um, critical look at yourself, um, like that's what I do every eight to 12 weeks. I kind of will change my workout plan and I'll stick to it for like every workout generally for me is the same for chest, for back, for arms and so on. And then every eight to 12 weeks, I'll look at those photos and I'll adjust the plan according to so what I need to So every work workout on. is relatively similar exercises. Similar, same. but it's, I've got my own method. I, 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 well, I designed from a combination of different people, but it's, it's like an eight week system. And the first two weeks, everything's 12 reps. So every warm up set, every building set, the overload set's 12. Um, so every two weeks, it drops by two reps. So it starts at t- two weeks of 12, weeks three and four are 10, weeks five and six are eight, and weeks seven and eight are six reps. And then I go back up to 12, and I've found that that's been my sort of go-to rep range for building muscle. Um, and I can find out it can still progress in a linear fashion that way, whereas if I'm sticking to eight reps for eight weeks, there's a, I'm always going to hit a plateau. Whereas every two weeks, I'm dropping the reps by two, and I'm able to keep improving there's some brilliance in that. Man. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's genius and simplicity, I feel. And whenever I try and explain it to, to new clients and stuff, they're like, is it really that simple? I'm like, it's, yes. it's that simple. It's the application of it exactly. over time is hard. Like you just you can't get – and this is what I also get people going, hey, I want to get – you know, I wanna, I'll do anything you tell me to do. I want to be a pro. I want to be the best. And I'll say, okay, all the hours of cardio, all the training. And you give them the whole spill and then they go, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that. And I'll say, you do that for 10 years. And like, oh, no, I don't want to do it for 10 years. <laughs> and you're like, well, if there was an easy option, don't you think I would have found it by yeah. now? And it's sort of slapping, you know, your sure. or my intensity and integrity of training and methods in the face. It's like, do you think I would have slacked off? I've been going hard for this most of my life now. Yeah. And if there was an easy way, I could give it to you, but I, I don't know it. Like, you just well, have to do it. Yeah, there's no such thing. And everybody's looking for the instant gratification because social media has yeah. a big impact on that. I spoke about this morning in the course. It's like... You know, the reason I was successful is because social media didn't impact the first 10 years of my life. I started at 17. By the time I was 27, I was pro. But what happened in between those things, I wasn't attached to the day-to-day posting of my PB yeah. on, on Instagram. I wasn't attached to having abs all the time. I was like, I'm not, I don't give a shit where I am right now. I give a shit where I am in five years and 10 years. Like, that's all the strategic plan toward building this great physique that's going to ultimately take me to the Olympia stage. It's not about, hey, man, I got to post a PB on yeah. Friday because this guy I just posted, I got to keep up with him and he's got great abs. He's got more followers than me. Who gives a shit, right? Like, mm. I'm like, I don't give a shit how many followers you got now. Like, where are you going to be in 10 years? And those yeah. are the people that are successful. And I talked about that this morning in the class. Um, like, my simple application is, is is very similar to yours. I'm like, well, how many exercises do you need? You know, I guarantee you get this question. Josh, how many exercises do I need for chest? Yeah. The answer is as many as you can do well. Yeah. Like, perfect. Right? Like yeah, if you, you, hit you don't need seven threshold, exercises. It's like it's like not in the exercises, it's everything in life. As soon as you hit your shit threshold, the quality's horrible. So why keep giving there? Stop. Like how many coaching clients can you take on? It's like as much until you hit your shit threshold <laughs> in account of your relationship and your yeah. friendships and your own training life. So it's like you can't be the best at all of those. There's going to be a limit and you can't – like I don't understand people have like 70 clients and they're all doing it well. Like how, do you have, how do you have a life outside of that? Like and how do you remember all the bits? I hardly remember all my bits and pieces and I'm professional at what I do. It's so damn hard to do that. So, yeah, I totally get, totally get what you're saying with that. Yeah, how, as many as it takes. That's a perfect illustration. When did you turn pro? Um, 2014. And you yeah. won the Australia – yeah, it was a pro qualifier. Um, actually, the guy in your class, Scott Goebel, I competed against him. I s- you saw him before. And you just did uh, the Australia, uh, the Aussie pro right after, didn't you? Like, yeah, you yeah. Won, you won the yeah. pro card jump on stage? Yeah, because that's like we don't have many pros here. Yeah. So I would have preferred to I think to I was competing year. in that show, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was you, um, Bonac, Roden. I'm sure you, you you did the next year, 2015, the Arnold for sure, I remember. I don't know if you were there. I don't know if I did 14. 14. No, I didn't think you did 14. I that one. It was 2015, you were here. Um, yeah, so, um, I, yeah, I turned pro. I would have preferred to wait and do the debut the year later, but you're straight into the the, um, the pro. And I it's almost like expected. Yeah, yeah, it's like Tony... Um, you've got your pro card. Will you come over and join us on the pro stage in front of everyone? You're going to go, no. You're gonna get the co- of course. No, yeah. I'm going to take this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going I'm to wait. Right. And I remember like uh, you go from like an amateur backstage to like a pro backstage. And I knew I was going to get smashed. And um, it was like, I think it was Branch and Sean sitting down. And who else? And another guy. 
And I'm just like a jokester, so I walked out and I'm like, hey, they're like, this is Josh, the new Aussie pro. And I'm like, there's a new sheriff in town, boys. There's a joke. And no one said anything. It was just like dead quiet. And I'm like, ooh. And I was like, I'm just joking, guys. <laughs> I'm just joking, guys. And they're like, quiet again. I'm like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> nope. Yeah. This is the pros. What yeah. did you learn um, from your transition from amateur to pro? Um, oh, good question. Um, I th it's still been a gradual progression about me being more professional about not only me being more diligent with my training and nutrition and everything like that and treating it more like it's my job now to, to make a living off and then everything around that to make a living. Like it's not like it used to be with sponsorships and stuff. Um, but it's what you do in the sport that can be a better platform to for coaching or academy or anything like that. You want to go that route. Um, so it's that professional mindset I needed to put into it. But like the, I'm saying, the mindset was probably the biggest thing, like stopping stop sabotaging myself like that going through McDon like McDonald's mm -hmm. and getting six Sundays when I don't even like Sundays. It was really, it was complete sabotaging of my mindset. Like if it was, I know I'm not good enough to win this show, but if I sabotage myself, then it's easier for my mind to handle because I know that. Because I can rationalize. Yeah, because I can rationalize me yeah. not being my best because I stuffed up. Yep. So it was just that. It's great it to like, have that awareness, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite aware about stuff, but it's like, a, and that's metacognition, right? You're thinking about your own thinking. So, that's what I do. I was like, oh, I'm looking back, man, well, that was fucking stupid, wasn't it? Like, don't do that again. But it's all growing. Like, it's living and learning and, yeah, like turning on that DNA, yeah. that genetics and growing from how, it. How did you create an awareness around metacognition? Is that something you've read or is that just like... A... Um, yeah, I think like reading and I've got like people who I look up to and listen to as well. Give and, me an idea. Who... Yeah. I've got, there's a guy in Australia, you'd love him, Craig Harper. He's really... Really, he's just probably the most aware person I've met. Really? Yeah, and he's um, he had the first personal training studios in Australia. I think before anyone else, I don't know, he just sort of started that that business without even having it overseas. It was just like a, there's a gap here, you need to have this. And um, and he's just, yeah, he's got he's got a bunch of books. He's written great books. Yeah, like one's called Stop Fucking Around. Yeah. Yeah, great, great book. <laughs> um, but it's just it's the way Sounds it's Sounds very Australian. Yeah, it is. Yeah, very yeah. Aussie. Um, but the way he projects and like it's entertaining as well as insightful. Yeah, so he's one of them. And then Jordan, Jordan Peterson. Yeah. I love listening to him. It's amazing. Yeah, incredible. Um, man, there's heaps. Who else? That's, right. That's great, mind? man. The fact that you're reading, you know, it's, yeah. it's funny because I do meet some bodybuilders who say, you know, I don't read. I'm like, oh, man, like if anything you can do for yourself, right? Like the two things I tell everyone to do is breathe and read. Like that's the one thing. If you don't already yeah. do, create a breathing practice. Which yeah, sounds breathing I should do more. It, just, it sounds listen. abstract or obscure, but like, dude, it's incredible the power of gaining control of, of your ability to breathe and be present in your breath. You know, allows you to be present in everything, right? If you want to be present in a hard set, if you want to be present when you're tired on, on a treadmill or whatever the hell you're doing, like, yeah. that being present is is your opportunity. You know, most people try to turn the turn off their brain. Like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Like be with your brain and that's that's your opportunity for progress. And I wish that somebody would have told me that when I was competing. It's like, don't mute out when it's hard. Become present when it's hard. And I just told this example today in class as well. Um, you know, this year I climbed a mountain and it was a long, long uh, mountain climb. And, you know, I, I, I walked up to the mountain and I was like looking at it. I was like, oh man, this is going to suck. Even the day, like the morning of, I woke up and like everything in my, my psyche was like, you don't do this. Like, <laughs> it's going to be so hard. <laughs> it's a body I, yeah, I, did, well, I did two this year, right? This is the second one. And I you've knew got to this... breathe for two people at your size. Right. It's a lot well, I'm normal. actually, my cardio is very good. Yeah. Um, and I, I was like, for some reason, I just built it up in my brain that this one was going to be really, really bad. I guess the pr the first one, the guy who I went with, totally undersold it. He goes, oh, it'd be like two, three hours. It's <laughs> fucking nine hours. Oh, no. And it was fine. Like, we, we made it. We almost died. But, like, we, we made it. Or I thought I was going to die. The second one in my brain, I'm like, don't do it, man. Don't, like, you're making it out to be such a terrible thing. You get to the base of the mountain, and I'm, like, setting myself, like, this is going to suck. It makes me suck, suck for eight hours. Like, eight hours up and then a couple hours back. And I walked up. You know, the first hour was just torture. My quads are burning. My heart, like, racing. My lungs are burning from the cold. And uh, and I looked around. And I'm like, God, it's a beautiful day. And I'm on this amazing mountain. I'm with two of my best friends in the world. And I smiled. And I said, this is not to suck. Like, embrace this. This is beautiful. And I said, thank you that I get to be out here, you know, blessed enough to have legs and walk and, and yeah. uh, have the time and the finances to be able to go do this. And the, the next like seven hours, I think I floated up the mountain, like no discomfort, 
no negative energy. My legs didn't burn. It was fun. Like it was easy because I embraced the reality of like I get to rather than I have to. Yeah. And that's yeah. just such a beautiful thing, man. And if, if bodybuilders can embrace that, all of a sudden you'll find the joy in the cardio. You'll find the joy in the diet. Like you get to eat the best foods in the world, right? Yeah. Like you you're eating, you're eating high quality. And I know it's hard, man, but like you can. And as soon as I did that, like that was a life-changing experience for me. And I literally think I floated up the mountain, man. Like it was easy. And I got to the top and I ran down and I'm like, God, where'd that come from? You know? And it's just like you have this endless abundance of energy and this endless abundance of, of focus. And we just don't tap into it because we're so resistant to like, you know, change or so resistant to challenge and or being with ourselves and being with our brain. And as soon as I did that, it was like that was that was a life-changing moment for me from so many levels. Um, even when I train now, like when you get into those places where like, fuck, this is going to suck. Like, no, smile, right? Like, smile, be happy. Like, I get to do this. Yeah. And like, you're, dude, you're one of the best bodybuilders in the world. The fact that I'm sure you create that, that framing for yourself is like, you have millions of people looking up to you now and going, I want to be like Josh. And just thinking about that, like I used to frame that when I walked on stage, right? There's a 17 year old kid who used to be me in the back row of this auditorium who's looking up to you going, oh my God, I want to do that one day. I don't think I can ever do it. And I want you, you need to let him know like, yes, you can. Yeah. Because awesome. I was once there too. Yeah. You know, that's do you, a, do you, Were you a big believer in visualization even back then? Oh, from the time I was 17, man. Yeah. yeah. I'm reading the book, this book now. You probably know the author. I can't believe it slipped my mind. Becoming Supernatural. Uh, uh, yeah, Joe Dispenza. That's it, Joe Dispenza. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah, he's yeah. I'm right into that book now, and he's like, "Can't believe I forgot his name because I was trying to think of that before." When I'm you know, going was... to his course next month. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm super pumped. In, man. Yeah, incredible. He's been on my podcast. Oh, oh wow, man, yeah. that's awesome. That's a great guest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, thanks uh, for having me on. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, man, dude, he's incredible. Go, yeah, some are good and some are not. Oh, uh, no, dude, come on, right? Don't, all right, <laughs> don't sell man. yourself short, yeah. man. Like you're doing, you're doing amazing things. Thanks, mate. And uh, I want to talk just a little bit about your prep. Yep. So um, you're just under six weeks. Under six. Yeah. I'm so. Walk me through 20 weeks. Um, where do you start? Um, well, what's, what's I started the first thing you with the whole off? rest, like the whole of last year for the, like six months. I trained, but then I, I rested of you know, detox my body out and had a good break and and got mentally falling in love with it again, as we, we were talking about earlier. Um, so it started there. I was just training and falling in love with training, getting my what body. What does that feel like to fall in love with training? Tell me about that. Yeah, it was a whole new experience because at the start, it was like, man, what am I doing? And and you're being forced to do it. I'm not really enjoying this. And and then, okay, let's taper the training back to like maybe three days a week. And then that turns into, oh, I'm actually wanting to get my fourth session in. And, and oh, this is weird, actually wanting to do it instead of, you know, when, you, when you're prep and speaking before, you were saying about how you're looking at it from a different perception, um, a perspective and having that on, on, when you diet for a couple shows a year, it's like you're always dieting. It's like there's no escape from it. So actually having the time off where I could eat what I wanted and do what I wanted, I realized that what I actually want to do is train and eat healthy. And then now in this prep, it's been so much easier to stick to the diet um, because I've been wanting to eat those foods and you know the you restrictions to, hard, right? but of course yeah. it's like a privilege to do it. Yeah. And looking at it as a privilege as opposed to a chore is always going to be you know, the better, healthier mindset and, and less stressful. Um, so starting this prep, falling in love with it again, is that is wanting to do it and man, I actually want to get another session in and man, I actually want to train twice today. And that was like, wow, this is weird. And, um, and then, okay, let's put more food in and let's see, you know, if, if I can increase my fats for the day, let's see how that changes. And that was how, it, how it worked for me. And leading into the prep at 20 weeks out, it was okay. Just finding a, a point of calories where it's, I'm still able to train heavy, but I'm progressing. And that's where I said, how, was... how many was it? How many was calories. it? It was about 4,000. Now I'm down to 3,500 calories. Yeah. So it was at 4,000 and I was able to still progress and lose weight, lose body fat and, and live quite heavy. Um, and it's like who you surround yourself with. Like I'm training at, at, at Doherty's gym and the one in Dandenong, it's like a, there's a lot of powerlifters there and, and strong guys and they've got like this board on there with like a squat bench and deadlift record. And although I'm not a powerlifter, I'm on that record. So when someone beats that, it makes me want to beat it even though I'm like I'm not that – a powerlifter, but it's that extra little challenge that, that keeps me that keeps me motivated. I'm like, hey, I was on that board, you know, because I pushed myself to that level mm -hmm. and then someone's beaten it. I'm like, hey, do I think I can have it in me to beat that? And um, yeah, but these young kids, man, they're damn strong. <laughs> well, they're training for that, right? It's yeah, a very yeah. different thing. Yeah, absolutely. But um, it's good fun. It's like Hell yeah. a bit of banter back and forth about me Hell just yeah. being a bodybuilder and then yeah. being a powerlifter. And so that's been fun, um, being around good, positive just people. Just flex your arm from like, hey, you got this? You can be, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got something you don't. Yeah. Um, you, you'll see him. I don't know if you met Gwaine. He's there to be there tonight, I think, having a steak. Real nice dude. Um, yeah, so being that and being around good people and being a good mental headspace. 
A gym's um, inspirational in itself, right? Like, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm walking in there, I'm like, man, I kind of want to compete again. Like, walking around, seeing all the pictures on the wall, I'm like, <laughs> oh, I, never, I missed the back room of the Olympia. I'm like, I want to train again. I'm like, I think if I had a great training partner, I'm like, eh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that would make it easy. Did yeah. you have many training partners? No, no. So early in my career, I did, but yeah. I, you know, last five years, I never did. Yeah. I had a couple guys that worked for me that it was always me pulling them along, right? But yeah. Um, early in my career, I had great guys, like when I was in Canada, um, the guys who I grew up with who, you know, were the guys who would kind of show up even though when you're being an asshole and, like, work hard with you even though they don't really want to. And, like, the guys who kind of really had integrity to – but they cared about you, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, had, I had, you know, three or four really good training partners who I'm in, indebted to for the rest of my life as being huge contributors. But in the last five years of my career, it was often just, like – you know, people keeping you company and, and yep. you know, timing the sets because you need somebody to you know, slow you down a little bit. And were you like instinctive about your training? Like, would you adjust the training time in the day or was it always religious? You have to be time, time was always the same. Okay. Um, but I, I'd be instinctive within the session. Like, yep. you know, always have to gauge it and kind of how it felt right. And I, I almost think of the simplest way to frame my, my um, exercise selection and volume was, was just like kind of looking at my body or my muscle like a gas gauge, like a fuel gauge, where if, if I felt like I was depleted, I didn't want to ever get kind of below the 50% fuel range. So if I felt like I was energized, I keep pushing and pushing and pushing because I realized that, you know, if the fuel gets too low within the muscle, the body will start breaking down. So I'd always just feel like that. Like some days I would really deplete intentionally. Like if I'm trying to lose fat, then I want to get that, you know, catabolic stimulus. But really it's just like how much volume and load can I push uh, without breaking down. Like once I felt like I'm depleted, workout's done. And some days I could push tremendous amounts of volume and some days it was small. Mm. But very, very subjective. Like, hey man, you know, if you feel like you get tired, you're still going to do the workout. You're just going to shift it a little bit. You might do heavier loads and less volume, right? Where if I feel energized, I might do heavy loads and high volume, right? So it's just kind of subjective that way. That was really how I fueled my workouts. Yeah. And what really I'd really admire about you was you're able to be one of the best bodybuilders on the planet still have wife and kids and I also have like MI40. So I'm like, how they, that's something I grapple with is trying to, the business side I've confined, I have the partner and the training good. And then I've got like coaching clients and stuff, but then I find like I'll have some good days that when I have the bad days, then that restricts me from wanting to have, mm -hmm. to book more people in because I feel like I don't want to give people bad service. And if my shit threshold's maximized, yeah. I'm not going to be able to give them If good you service. care for advice. Absolutely. Um, don't pull back on your bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, push the bodybuilding because you want to leave a legacy of greatness. Yeah. Um, what you're doing that I didn't as well as you are is building a skill set or a knowledge base in the background, right? So the first five years of my career, I was so single-mindedly focused on I just want to be a great bodybuilder. I didn't read that much, didn't take any courses, didn't learn from other people, didn't I wouldn't study Jordan Peterson. Um, so that will accelerate what happens afterwards. So you still like, the, the big thing is like, as soon as I'm done competing, now I feel like I have to like compensate and work twice as hard as everybody else because I spent the last 20 years being a bodybuilder. Um, so it's almost like, not I'm gonna say wasted, but like ultimately, like everyone else is building businesses, building skill sets, learning new jobs, learning new skills. And I didn't do any of that shit. I became really good at one thing, but I neglected a whole bunch of other stuff. So, you know, it's kind of my fuel now to work twice as hard, but just continue doing what you're doing. Go fucking hard on bodybuilding. Because, yeah. like, I probably, you know, the thing that changed my life was my kids. And we talked about that. But, um, you know, I, I, like I said, don't go pull back. Yeah, but continue bit. when you do have time to, to hold yourself to creating the habit of educating yourself one hour every day, man. One hour every day. Not, not, nothing less. And carve time for that. Yeah. Like, you know, make it the same time every day so you can't screw it up. It's always scheduled so you know it's the same. Like, read one hour every day. You know, listen to a podcast or, or an audio book where you do in your car. You're doing two hours of cardio a day. There's your there's two hours, you know. Yeah. Uh, that would be one thing that I would say. Is See, because, that's good advice. Well, because when you're done, now you got a skill set. Now you got yeah. a thought process. Rather than, like, having to kind of start from this foundational base, you don't need to start a business yet. You could. Like, you, you'll definitely have a benefit. But it's going to pull away from this other thing. The more things you do, it's just pulling away time and energy and focus. So if you if you're committed to bodybuilding for a few more years, like just continue to learn, man. Continue yep. to, to sharpen the sword, learn your craft, um, learn other skills that you know you want to do when you're done. Because, like I said, now I'm just voraciously consuming things because I feel like I'm compensating for it. Yeah, and that would be a really powerful place for you to be to not only be the best bodybuilder in the world, which you will be, um, but also now have a skill set that like, hey, I can actually, you know, run a business or I can actually have a you know, a useful skill set beyond this thing. Yeah, thanks. Well, that that's why I asked because I'm I'm not I'm not someone that doesn't take people's opinions on board. I can sit back and reflect and yeah. rationalize, uh, and, and look at it from a critical mindset. And that's what you hear that now without 
it's well, not in the 90s of bodybuilding anymore and bodybuilding although it's getting what seems to be more popular with social media there's less financial reward for bodybuilders so there's so many people want to do it for yeah free. so that's and then you hear people saying well, you don't want to be you know retired and not have anything to fall back on and you know we're financially sound there's no issues with that but at the same time those thoughts come into my mind i think well maybe i should sit this up or that up and you've actually just reinforced what's been planted like my wife's dad he was a decathlete in the commonwealth games and olympic games and um he said that says that to me he worked a couple jobs and i look up to him a lot and he says put everything into it you don't want to have regrets because you have to put your time elsewhere mm -hmm. and that's something that sets but then when you hear people talk of course and if i dis i disregard people's conversation i'll lose all ability to connect with them so i'm still always open and to, to to people's advice yeah, i think no matter what you do you'll look back and go i could have worked it just a little bit harder and that's a shitty place to look back like yeah. we're all going to do that because i know that's just our personality but like ronnie says it, that right give it all man he's like i wanted two more reps on the squat and i'm like man Dude. that's like a huge squat already. yeah right because yeah. that's just human if if you're as successful as you are in this sport no matter what you do you win 10 olympias you're still gonna go i could fuck i could have won 11 yeah. or yeah. i could have won that first one you know yeah. like it's like that's just the way your brain works so walking along through your prep man like yeah. i don't want to i don't want to lose that because i think there's value there and all of sure. us just want to know some of the tactics yeah so like when do you start cardio when do you start cutting calories yeah. when do you how, how do you progress your training is it still yeah, the 12 8 i'll get into that yeah. so my my whole belief i'm a, I'm a big believer with cutting Cardio, morning and night. Um, right from the beginning? Yeah, even from the beginning, but just at a low level, maybe 20 minutes, but still split morning and night. Walking? Yeah, walking or stairs. I used to, I used, like Chad got me onto the stairs a lot, <laughs> and but I hate those damn stairs. But I found, <laughs> well, you're you know, 300 pounds. Yeah. It's not the same it's, as a 120 yes, pound exactly. girl. It's not, it's not easy. Um, but I love walking, and, and we, we brought a puppy this year. Um, so I was like, you know, taking that mm. for a walk now. It's a pretty big dog. So it walks, I just leave it off lead, and I, I'm able to walk at my pace. Um, and we're taking it to obedience, so it's a good dog. But it's like that's great for me because then that gives me a bit of joy to see that happen. It keeps me kind of accountable that oh, I've got to take the dog for a walk, which yeah. I want to. Um, so I'm doing that morning and night. And then if I f and then so I'll build build that up. So what I do is I'll kind of like swap my calories around where my protein might not be so high at the start. There'll be a bit more carbohydrates and fats in there, and then I increase my protein. I'll take some off the carbs and fats and put that on top of the protein content to sort of balance the calories out around about the same. Um, and through my method is like like a neogenesis. If your body needs to break down that for energy, it will. And there's it's a heavily it's it's a more expensive process for the body to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm burning more calories doing that. Um, but the cardio leading into the contest increases from 20 minutes all the way up to an hour, and then sometimes three cardio sessions a day if I need to. And that middle session will be like. Um, stairs or something um, but on top of that my weight training get increases as well so I'll start with maybe four exercises per muscle group to then five and then I'll go to six exercises so the intensity picks up and I'm not a huge um, trainer with drop sets and supersets and stuff like that or high reps but when it's like eight weeks out of a show I start doing that in my last exercise or last two exercises and it kind of picks up to then when I get a little bit weaker at four weeks out my last three exercises I'll drop set and superset and chase basically chase the pump kind of mindset. Um, so all those increases of energy expenditure come up as the show gets closer. And I, and I get, then I go really low in calories. So I'll just probably have two, two to three carb meals a day um, and maybe one fats meal, but I'll still get fats through animal fat, whether it be steak or, or lamb. I'm actually a big eater of like lamb backstrap. Yeah. I really like lamb. What are your fats and sources? Um, almonds, almond spread, um, olive oil. I'll put That's that not a things. gateway for you? No, no. Well, well, my wife has to measure it out when it gets close. Actually, it is a gateway. So she, yeah. but it's not something that'll make me eat other stuff. Uh, it'll make me eat the whole jar. Man, I remember when she first <laughs> measured it out. I'm like, you better go back and measure that properly. Like that is not two <laughs> tablespoons because my two tablespoons is half the damn jar. Yeah, yeah. That's the funny part with that. Like that. That maybe is the worst habit I have acquired from being a bodybuilder. Is like if I cheat, I don't cheat with like junk, but I'll be like, <laughs> I have some almond butter. Yeah, half a jar later, right? Because you know, a tablespoon is is a tablespoon yeah like it's not it's half the jar yeah and that maybe is the only bad habit that i'm like damn i wish i had done that when i was a bodybuilder <laughs> um, so, yeah, and on. then last week of my prep what i do is i'll increase my water intake every day so i water load and i go from having um i go to basically almost almost no carbohydrates and do just glycogen depletion sessions so i do a total body workout and pick one it's actually the way my weight training is structured you know i said about have eight week 
an eight-week training system. So exercises one is always the same, and two and three and four are always the same. So what I do is I get exercise one from every single workout, and I put that in a total body workout. And then I get exercise two, and I put that in total body workout two. Yeah. And I go through a circuit, and I go through every, every circuit in the one session. It might take like 40, 40 minutes, but it's like just a 20 to 30 rep set per exercise. It just depletes the glycogen. Um, and then I load. But there's, I've seen studies where it, glycogen depleting and loading has no benefit, but it's always been beneficial to me. So it's, it's something that I keep doing. Yeah, the study may have never been done on a 300-pound bodybuilder. Yeah, yeah. Well, there Just you go. guessing. Yeah, well, that's so true. It, if it works for you, man, it works for you. Yeah. And like, I think that most people maybe overestimate what the benefit is, um, but there's still certainly some benefit, right? Like you, you don't want to go in depleted. You don't want to over-carb. You have to just find that right place. That's, that's a nice yeah. balance for you. Yeah, definitely. What's something I was doing as a, you know, IMBA competitor and and yeah. doing the IFBB on my family. Figured out it work. It's work, so I keep doing that, that same 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 method. How do you um, perceive stress? Like uh, right now, would you say what's your level of stress, and uh, are you doing anything to manage it? Um, yeah, the thing is with with me, I need to make sure that I'm mindful of knocking back. Um, like saying no to things to occasions. I mean, having a podcast with you was too too hard to say no oh, to, but thank you, man. that's all right. But, it, you know, on a day like today being so hot. Stay home. You would have been training and gone straight down. Well, that's half the reason why we're here. Yeah, good, good spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but it's that. It's managing stress because I noticed leading into a contest, there's just more opportunities, which is great. Um, but then the problem is if I do take up those opportunities, I'm just more stressed. And, mm -hmm. and if those opportunities are meant to be, they'll be there after the contest. So... That's something I've had to become more professional about over the last couple of years. Um, so that's a huge thing. Um, and then having like the close group of friends, like four or five people that I'm, I invest in and I keep that um, always connected. Whereas, because there's more and more people just come into your life and especially when it comes into a comp time, like all of a sudden more people want to catch up and go for coffee. And it's like, man, you weren't like this in my off season. Right. When I had the time to do it, like, this is now me being knuckling down. and Isn't that interesting? Yeah, and I don't want to not connect with them, but at the same time, it's like this is very important to pick those four or five people in my life and, yeah. and keep them close. People try to migrate towards your energy, right? When you raise your energy, you're gonna, people are going to try to come along, and that's just life. Yeah. And that's, you know, a leader will always want to be followed. People want to follow the leader, and you be, you're becoming a leader. You are a leader, and you know, it's always going to be the reality. So your awareness of that, your meta-awareness is valuable yeah um because it's it's gonna happen forever man you'll always be a leader even when you leave the sport yeah um what's your legacy hmm Gee, great question man you're good at this um my legacy now is especially after having that whole experience in 2017 i kind of thought what do i want to be remembered by and what do i want people to come up to me if i'm actually at a booth representing a brand do i want them to come up and say hey you have big muscles or, or like a Instagram thing, you have a nice ass. Or do I want to be someone who's made a difference and said something that maybe has resonated that well, that it's set them off on a path? And I do these things called daily mantras on my social media, and it's only like 30 seconds or a minute long. Well, I'll just put a, whatever's on my mind or on my heart, a bit of perspective on, it could be anything. It could be like that, the love bank, or it could be um, being, you know, standing your ground, knowing your worth, little things like that that's, that sort of helped me in my life that I give back and, and project out. And some things I could come across looking like a bit of a tool, but it's if it helps one person, then I think you know, if, if my life ends, at least I've made what little difference I believe I have. Um, so that's a huge thing for me now going forward is using a platform for something more beneficial than just a body. Because I believe the body is something that is amazing and, and it's awesome and what we can do with it. But at the same time, it's like, well, where does it go from there? And the people that are drawn to that, how do we then help them become better, better versions of themselves as well? Do you know that you're going to be Mr. Olympia? I hope so. It's become more, at the start, I was like, that's no way that could happen. And then getting better and better at contests and seeing my body improve, it's like this, this is a reality. And if it doesn't happen, then that, I'm still cool with that because that's not my whole purpose in life. But I'm aiming and striving towards it and I'm going to do everything in power to make it happen. Um, and if it happens, unbelievable, thank God. If it doesn't happen, something else is better for me is out there. There's yeah. got to be some other message in life that's, that's for me if that's not the case. That's beautiful, man, because you realize it's just like getting your pro card. Nothing changes when yeah. it happens, right? It's, yeah. it's, we all have this 
belief about like when I win the show or when I do the Olympia or when I win the Olympia, it's always this, this chase in the external. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, again, I talk about this stuff a lot is it's never about the external man. Like you can make millions of dollars and it's not going to change the person you are, but the process of the everyday attachment to discipline and, and self character and development is that's the victory, man. So as long as you see that, yeah. the victory is in what you're already doing. It's it's the acknowledgement of the meta awareness of all these daily little opportunities to become the best version of yourself. That's the victory. Because, you know, with the, I mean, the best example that comes to mind for me is, you know, people go, what's your best at replacing? And, and everyone would think it's second at the Arnold. And I was like, no, it's fourth at the Arnold. And then we're like, what do you mean? That, sh that that prep was the best prep I've ever had. I put my heart and soul into finishing fourth at the Arnold. Like, I give everything. And I went on stage, and I walked off stage knowing I was a champion. Yeah. Then when I got second at the Arnold, it was a terrible prep. Like, I got sick. I probably cheated on my diet a couple of times, missed some cardios. And I went into that show knowing that I didn't deserve to win. That's why I didn't. And I had the prep that I had the year before. I would have won that show. Yeah. And so people go, oh, you know, like – what happened? Well, I was like, I wasn't all in that show, man. Like I had so many things happen in my life and I was literally like, I don't want to do it. So then you rationalize like, oh, I'm not going to do it. So I'm going to go screw around this diet. And the next day, you're like, oh, I look better. Maybe I should do it. You know, like all these rationalizations. And that's what, you know, maybe the lesson in bodybuilding is it's not about the end result, man. Yeah. It's about knowing that you've done everything every single day. That's the joy and the suffering. That's the joy and the discipline, right? Well, so yeah, when it's hard, good. The joy is in progress, definitely. Yeah. And what you said really resonated with me today was that like, you did that mountain and you stopped and were able to take it in and basically smell the roses, so to speak. That's what's important, like not just doing the mountain and having it done and ticking it off. And that's like you see these days, it's going back to social media. That's what I feel like a lot of it is, is like I just want to go to this location to get a, me in a photo and then boot off. It's I don't like, think I have a photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that is, and those are the things yeah. that are most important. It's well, like the, it's the, the memory memories. here. Absolutely, like yeah. it's what it means to you and the memories. And if you are doing something because you want to do it, at least enjoy it while you're doing it because it's going to be gone sooner or later. Like, it's going to be gone so quick. And then like that's something that my dad sort of instilled in me. Not, but It was by his living, not by his, his words. Like He was like, oh, if I hadn't have, if we didn't have you kids, I would have been in this rock band and we would have been traveling the world. I was like, no, no, you wouldn't. But that was like the regret he I used to hear in his voice. And you always catch more than you're taught. And just seeing what he was doing and reflecting on it and how much regret, I just caught that. I'm like, I don't want to have that. I don't want to have that regret. I want to make sure that I've, I've finished and it was either I got injured or something happened, but I put everything into it and that was it. Then I can move on to the next step in my life. Beautiful, man. Dude, thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you. I appreciate you making no, time. I, I know you're close to the awesome. show and uh, I made you go out of your way. But I think it worked out better because we got some air conditioning. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> we're sitting, yeah. sitting here sweating. It's cool. So it's 44 degrees Celsius here in, in uh, Melbourne today. And That's like, what is it, 115 or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hot. I'll cook my steak outside today. Yeah, exactly. We're going to yeah. cook oh, it on, on, my kangaroo. on the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much, Thanks. buddy. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.